Welcome to Radio Who, What, Why. I'm Jeff Sheckman. For George Bush, it was once part of the axis of evil. For Donald Trump, Iran seems only to be part of an axis of firing up his base, placating Israel, and being supine to the Saudis. The Iran nuclear deal was far better and more enforceable than anything we will ever see with North Korea. Iran, according to those on the ground, the IAEA inspectors and other parties to the deal, often referred to as the JCPOA, was a deal that Iran more or less was abiding by. Now with the U.S. having pulled out of the deal and imposing new sanctions, the Europeans, the Chinese, and the Russians, the other parties to the deal, are trying, along with Iran, to hold all the pieces together. The problem and complexity is that it's about both proliferation and economics. And while the administration is filled with Iran hawks, many of whom still seek regime change in Iran, there's no telling where all of this will wind up. In a global neighborhood that remains a tinderbox, what's next for Iran, for Syria, and for the region? To try and bring all of this together and provide an Iranian perspective, I'm joined by Ambassador Saeed Hussein Musavian, one of the foremost authorities on the subject of Iran. Ambassador Musavian is a Middle East security and nuclear policy specialist at the Program on Science and Global Security at the Woodrow Wilson Center at Princeton. He's a former Iranian ambassador to Germany, head of the Foreign Relations Committee of Iran's National Security Council, and he was the spokesperson for Iran in its nuclear negotiations with the international community. He's the author of the previous books, The Iran Nuclear Crisis, a memoir, and Iran in the United States, an insider's view of the failed past and road to peace. It is my pleasure to welcome Saeed Hussein Musavian to Radio Who, What, Why. Mr. Ambassador, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you very much, Jeff. Was there surprise inside Iran with the decision that the administration, the U.S. administration made to pull out of the deal, out of the JCPOA? Certainly it's something that the administration, that Trump had signaled repeatedly, but the fact that it actually happened, did that surprise anyone in Iran? First of all, Jeff, let me uh, mention that although I'm working at Princeton University, but the, the, what I express in this interview and on my op-eds, other interviews, is just my personal analysis and personal view, and this is not Princeton University position. Uh, about your question, uh, I would say no, because uh, during even during the negotiations 2013, 2014, 2015, there was a big skepticism in Iran whether any deal would be reached or not because of hostile U.S. position. And second, if any deal uh, achieved, whether the U.S. would comply with the deal or not. It was, uh, I mean, one of the most important discussions we had during domestically inside Iran during uh, the period of negotiation. The reason is that Iranians, after Iran-Iraq war, uh, they have had uh, three, four major compromises with the U.S., and the U.S. practically failed to deliver its commitments uh, on all of them. That's why uh, frequently, repeatedly, Iranian supreme leader was telling the Iranian nation in 2013, 2014, 2015 that, look, you should not trust the U.S. I'm sure the U.S. is not going to abide to its commitment. We cannot trust the U.S. I have um, not prevented the government to negotiate directly with the U.S., but I am not confident. I don't trust the U.S. The U.S. is not going to uh, uh, implement the deal. Yeah. And it, it was a big discussion. Ultimately, the deal was agreed. Of course, it was a big surprise uh, because uh, about 35 years hostilities, no relation, no diplomatic relations, no high-level direct negotiations. For the first time, Iran and the U.S. at the level of foreign ministers started to negotiate the most 
uh, a disputed issue between Iran and the U.S., which was the nuclear, Iranian nuclear program. You have heard many times from U.S. Of, uh, authorities saying, even at the level of president, saying that Iranian nuclear program is national security threat number one for the U.S. But it was really surprised, not only to Iranians, to many Americans, even Europeans, because even on the most disputed, complicated issue between Iran and the U.S., when the two countries, they negotiated only after 18 months, they could agree on a very comprehensive deal, which the other world powers, they all also agreed. The deal was uh, implementing perfectly from the Iranian side, even up to today. I mean, the last report of the IAEA, uh, International Atomic Energy Agency, uh, it was, was issued just two, three months ago for 11th time after the beginning of implementation of the deal, I mean January 2016. Uh, for 11th time, the IAEA has uh, confirmed Iran full compliance. What was the argument that won the day inside of Iran, inside that debate that you were talking about? Obviously, President Rouhani seemed to be the most positive in terms of what the potential for the deal was. What was the argument that won the day to get Iran to do that deal? You know, uh, the Iran started nuclear negotiation with EU3, Europeans, Germany, uh, UK, and France, 2003. The negotiations continued for 10 years, where Russia, China, Europeans, they were all involved, but at the end, for any final deal, it should go to United Nations Security Council, and the United States was a member of UN Security Council, and the U.S. should agree. That's why during negotiations from 2003 to 2013 with other world powers failed because U.S. was not in the, involved directly. Therefore, America, Russians, Chinese, Europeans, they were encouraging Iran to enter direct high-level negotiations with the U.S. because U.S. also is between five permanent members, and the deal would never be reached if the U.S. is going to oppose. And Iran uh, finally agreed to go for direct high-level negotiations with the U.S., but coming back to your question, skeptic, uh, uh, skepticism. Many, many, many people, they were skeptic in Iran, especially uh, principalist, conservative, the right wing. Mm -hmm. All they were say, saying, it is a mistake, you should not go to negotiation, the U cannot trust the U.S., uh, the U.S. is not going to abide to any commitment, and so on, so on, so Given that 10 years of negotiation with the Europeans, now that the U.S. is out of the deal, is that a plus in terms of Iran sticking with the deal as far as the Europeans and the Russians and the Chinese go, sticking with a P4 plus one arrangement? <laughs> See, Jeff, to understand the Iran nuclear deal, I need to explain one very, very important issue. The reason Chinese, Russians, Europeans, India, and overwhelming majority of international community is supporting the deal, the first reason to my understanding is uh, that this deal is the most comprehensive agreement ever reached during the history of non-proliferation. 170 pages, which uh, includes the highest level of transparency measures on nuclear program, which includes every objective guarantees for non-diversion of a peaceful nuclear program to weapon program. This is really an asset for non-proliferation in the world 
because the other agreements, uh, including NPT, Non-Proliferation Treaty, which is the main international convention, it has a lot of shortages. That's why North Korea could easily withdraw and to go to nuclear bomb. <clears throat> the world powers, with 200 scientists, they negotiated uh, not for, uh, I mean, uh, only for two years, perhaps for 13 years, to create the most comprehensive, detailed agreement during the history of non-proliferation to assure that Iranian nuclear program would never divert toward weaponization. This is really an asset. It is far beyond Iranian nuclear issue because it could be an asset for nuclear weapon free zone in Middle East. It can be an asset for uh, the nuclear weapon uh, free the world from nuclear weapon free because there is no other agreement which you can uh, find better than this, uh, including every intrusive inspection, the highest level of transparency measures, open nuclear program, all limits. Uh, on heavy water, on all limits on enrichment. Any country is going to accept Iranian nuclear deal on its nuclear program. That country for definitely forever would not be able to go for nuclear bomb. Looking at that agreement, looking at the JCPOA as a model, as you're talking about, even a model for the whole region, is that a powerful argument for Iran to stay in the deal with the Europeans, the Russians, and the Chinese? You know, Iranians, they are going to prove to international communities that first, on any disputed issues with the world powers, including the U.S., they prefer diplomacy and they are ready to negotiate and they are ready to, to be flexible and they are ready to agree. And if they agree, they would be fully committed. This is what they have practically shown on the nuclear deal. 18 months of negotiation with the U.S. Secretary John Kerry was involved. The U.S. Foreign Ministry was involved. The other five powers, they were involved. They agreed. And now uh, all countries, even the U.S. officials, even your health secretary Mattis a month ago went to the Congress and said, I have read this deal. It's very comprehensive. It's a very good deal. And Iran has fully complied. The UN Secretary General many times has said Iran has fully complied. Iranians are going to show to international community that they are really ready for diplomacy negotiation. And if there is any agreement, they would be really committed and the world can count on Iran. One. Second, it is, I think this is a good argument for the international community to support the deal beyond Iranian-American disputes because everyone can, is convinced already if the countries in the Middle East are ready to accept the same limits and transparency measures Iran has accepted within the nuclear deal then we would have definitely nuclear weapon free zone in Middle East. You know, the United Nations Security Council passed this, the first resolution in the 1970s. It is about 50 years now on nuclear weapon free zone in the, in the Middle East. But for 40, 50 years, this initiative has failed. Now there is a document for one country the, 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 the best scientists, nuclear scientists of the world, they have negotiated, the best diplomats, all powers, all five permanent members of United Nations Security Council, they all have signed, and everyone is convinced. Because this is the most comprehensive agreement of the non-proliferation history, if other countries in the Middle East is going to comply, then we would easily have nuclear weapon free zone in the Middle East. If I were President Trump, because President Trump was going to fight Obama's legacy, 
And he was going to say, I am going to create a bigger legacy. Okay. He was going to create uh, uh, an agreement with Iran or the region with uh, Trump brand. Okay, that's fine. But President Trump could come and say, now I'm going to use this uh, agreement to bring nuclear weapon free zone in Middle East. This could be about uh, President Trump's legacy. Of course, getting uh, Israel or Pakistan to buy into that seems pretty impossible. First of all, Pakistan is not part of Middle East. Second, uh, Israel has supported uh, the nuclear weapon free zone in Middle East and is the only country in the Middle East with the nuclear weapon. Now, Israel is accusing Iran day and night, and you remember Prime Minister Netanyahu uh, had uh, a press conference uh, claiming that Iranian nuclear program is not peaceful, Iran is after nuclear bomb, and so on, so on. So, okay. Iran is a member of non-proliferation treaty, and the sole international agency which is responsible for nuclear program of a member of the state is International Atomic Energy Agency, IAEA. They all have proved that Iran has fully complied the deal and the Iranian nuclear program is peaceful. And Israel, while Israel is the only country with the nuclear bomb, Will, uh, while other countries in Middle East, they all agree to go ahead for a nuclear weapon free zone in the Middle East. While this is UN resolution, not once. We have these resolutions for many, many times during the last four or five decades. Why we should not, the U.S. should not pressure Israel to accept the same deal in order to bring the willing of international community for zero nuclear bomb in whole Middle East. Why all pressures and sanctions and accusations should be on Iran, which is member of NPT, does not have nuclear bomb and has signed to the most comprehensive deal of non-proliferation history. Given the sanctions that are being put in place, how difficult is it going to be, in your view, for Iran and the Europeans to be able to continue this deal? It would be difficult because one of the elements of the deal is that the all six powers, they have uh, been committed, they are committed to uh, uh, deliver economic benefits to Iran in return for such a deal. Uh, now the U.S. is violating the deal. The U.S. is violating the United Nations Security Council resolution. The U.S. The US is violating 12 resolutions of International Atomic Energy Agency, but worse. The U.S. is punishing the other countries and Iran because of full implementation of a deal which is UN resolution. I mean, this is really strange during the history of uh, United Nations Security Council also, because now a member is punishing the other member states for compliance with a resolution. The other countries, Iran and the other world powers, everybody is complying with the resolution 2231, which is related to nuclear deal. And the U.S. is killing the deal, withdrawing from the resolution and punishing the other countries because they have shown their commitment to U.N. resolution. That's why we are getting to a very, very complicated situation. As I understand, Europeans, Chinese, Russians, Indians, and the international community, they want to keep the deal. They want to comply with UN Security Council. They want to support the deal. But at the same time, I mean, the secondary sanctions, if the U.S. is going to implement extraterritorial and punish the other countries because of economic relations with Iran, there, there would be definitely a big crisis for the future of the deal. The Chinese seem to be anxious to step in and try and pull all of this together. Do they have a bigger role to play than they have so far? Uh, I think Chinese um, 
they would have much more role because our experience shows during 2012 to tw- uh, 26 to 20 uh, 2006 sorry to 2012 when we had UN resolutions we had international consensus a sanction in Iran, the most comprehensive sanctions, unilateral, multilateral, international, six UN resolutions, all type of sanctions from oil, central bank, everything was there. However, Chinese economic trade relation from 2006 to 2012 increased dramatically with Iran while economic trade relation of Western countries decreased dramatically. I mean, for example, the European share in Iranian economy and trade before 2006 UN sanctions was something like 30, 35, 40 percent. But after uh, 2012, uh, the share of Europeans came down to 10%, but the share of Chinese uh, increased from 10 to 40, 45%. Therefore, China has shown has huge capacity, and I believe uh, this round of confrontation and challenge between the U.S. and Iran would be a little bit different. Uh, compared to Ahmadinejad period, because this time we have UN resolution, Iran is complying the resolution, the international community is convinced Iran is a good guy and the US is bad guy because killing a deal. And uh, if Chinese, Russians, Europeans are going to continue economic relation with Iran is based on United Nations Security Council resolution. That's why I think, although I am sure the, there would be a big challenge because of U.S. secondary sanctions, but at the end, there is a big chance to preserve the deal minus the U.S. How has the termination of this deal, how has it added or how might it add to growing tensions in the Middle East, ten- further tensions between Iran and Israel, and tensions in the region overall? See, uh, Iranian supreme leader, who is the ultimate decision maker, like, I mean, the U.S. president, he has the same authority, perhaps a little bit less than U.S. president. He said, we would uh, watch the negotiations, nuclear negotiations, and the result. If there is a result, if the U.S. comply with the agreement, complies with the agreement, then Iran would be ready to start negotiation with the U.S. on the other issues like regional issues. It was the uh, Iranian statement before the deal. Therefore, Iran was watching to see how the U.S. would behave after the deal. If the U.S. is going to fully imply the deal, then this would have created trust on the Iranian side for negotiating on the other regional disputes like Syria, like Yemen, like Iraq, like Lebanon, like Afghanistan, and so. But now, when the U.S. has violated the first highest level agreement Um, agreed between Iran and the U.S. after 40 years. Now Iranians, they say, how we can trust you to negotiate for uh, on the other issues, even if there is a negotiation, even if we agree on some of uh, the regional issues, then another U.S. president can come and say, you know what, I don't like it, and can kill it. How we can trust the U.S. with such a system? Is Iran willing to enter into a new set of negotiations with the U.S., looking at a a new deal, a new framework? I think if President Trump changes his his behavior, uh, complying with the U.N. resolution implementing the Iranian nuclear deal, Iran would be ready to start dialogue with the U.S., negotiation with the U.S., on the other regional issues to bring peace and stability and in the region, whether we like it or not. U.S. is a big power in the region and international power. And Iran is a big regional power, if not the most powerful 
a country in the region. Therefore, at the end, this would be really help, helpful, positive, constructive for peace, security, stability in the region if the U.S. and Iran would cooperate. We have civil war, we have terrorism, we have failed states, we have the multiple crises in the Middle East. Middle East practically is at the verge of collapse. Libya has collapsed, Syria is in deep crisis, Yemen is in fight. I mean, everywhere we have fight, terror, explosions, disintegration, the threat of this, even between Arab allies, look at Qatar and Saudi Arabia. And don't forget <clears throat> that it was uh, Arab countries for example, GCC countries, Gulf cooperation countries, cooperated with NATO attacking an Arab country like Libya. It is an Arab country, Saudi Arabia, UAE, with the U.S. are attacking Yemen. It was Saddam Hussein, an Arab country who invaded Iran and invaded Kuwait, an Arab country. Therefore, these Arabs are attacking the other Arab countries, creating war crisis, and at the end, when they fail, they blame Iran. And of course, there's been further conflict of late between Iran and Israel as well. Yeah, the contrast, the con uh, I mean, the tension between Iran and Israel, Jeff, has been ongoing after revolution. It is not something new. And Iranians, they have been threatening Israel. Israelis, they have been threatening Iran even more than Iranian threats. Israelis, they have threatened Iran. Netanyahu, day and night, is threatening Iran, pushing the U.S. to attack Iran, to bring regime change in Iran, to sanction Iran. But the problem with the U.S. media is that if Iran threatens Israel, this is the leading news number one. If uh, ten times a day, Prime Minister Netanyahu threatens Iran. Nobody cares, you know. Do you think that the Europeans have the political will to stick with this? Yes. I'm totally convinced Europeans have very powerful political will to him because it is, of course, an Obama legacy, but more it is European legacy. Because Europeans started this nuclear negotiation with Iran in 2003, Europeans, they have invested 15 years on this deal. And this is the most an important foreign policy achievement of uh, United Europe, European Union. And I have no doubt that the Europeans will have political will, but I really don't know whether they have economic capacity or not. Political capacity, they, they have political will. The capacity on the economic side, we need to watch what's going to happen. What are the impacts going to be of the sanctions on Iran at this point? Definitely would harm Iran. Jeff, no doubt about it. Um, already Iranian uh, uh, national currency um, is uh, facing with big de uh, devaluation. It is not only because of U.S. sanctions, because just U.S. sanctions started some, some, some days ago. Uh, Iranian economic system has huge dysfunctionalities and problems from corruption, from uh, too much involvement of state over the economy, not uh, a real privatization happened after the revolution. They have a lot of major problems. All these domestic problems coupled with the U.S. sanctions definitely would create more problems for Iran. But what at the end? The end question is that whether the U.S. would be able to bring regime change Iran through sanctions and pressures, I say no, because already the U.S. has tried for 40 years every possible uh, coercion from uh, cooperating with Saddam Hussein on military war with Iran 
to providing chemical uh, material and technology for Saddam to use chemical weapons against Iran, to cyber war, assassination of nuclear scientists, economic war, political war, intelligence war. And after 40 years, the U.S. is extremely angry and has lost its control because they say Iran now has influence everywhere in the region, is very powerful, and the U.S. allies have been weakened. Therefore, the, the, the conclusion and the outcome of 40 years of U.S. pressures and sanctions has made practically Iran more resistant and more powerful. This is what the U.S. says. And now President Trump is going to experience what the United States of America has experienced for 40 years, and they have failed. But after 40 years now, we have a deal as an outcome of high-level direct negotiations. Why you are not going to use this one in order to resolve the other disputed issues? I've got to let you go, but finally, is it your sense that there are any other back-channel negotiations going on right now, either through the Europeans, through any other nations or organizations? As far as I know, some countries like Oman, like um, Switzerland, they are trying to mediate and to bring negotiation between Iran and the U.S., but I heard Iranian foreign minister just two days ago said, as far as he knows, there is no back-channel official negotiation direct between Iran and the U.S. Ambassador Hussein Musavian, I thank you so much for spending time with us today. Thank you very much, Jeff. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for listening and for joining us here on Radio Who, What, Why. I hope you join us next week for another Radio Who, What, Why podcast. I'm Jeff Sheckman. If you like this podcast, please feel free to share and help others find it by rating and reviewing it on iTunes. You can also support this podcast and all the work we do by going to whowhatwhy.org forward slash donate.